Hi, I'm Scarlett Howard. We're now on episode three of my documentary. So today's episode is not as glamorous and as fun as you might think that the other ones were. Um, we're gonna dive deep into a real personal issue of mine that affects my day-to-day -day life, which I think is important that I share with you guys because ultimately this is a huge part of my life and hiding it would be hiding a big part of me. So when I was 21 years old, which is quite a while ago now, I know I look very young, um, I was on holiday in Dubai and I caught what I thought was just a standard UTI. Quite common for women. Um, and they normally last about three days, you take some antibiotics and then they go. But this UTI changed my life forever. So I had a pretty bad night last night. I was up till four o'clock in pain. Couldn't sleep. Um, so I'm feeling a bit exhausted today. It's really hard because you never know when it's going to flare bad. So it's frustrating when you've got loads you want to do or a day planned and actually you end up being awake all night or you're in too much pain, you can't do anything. It's so hard to know when, it, when it's going to happen. So, as I explained, I was on holiday. I started to get symptoms of UTI. It was really painful, but I thought, you know what, I'll leave it three or four days till I get home and I'll go and see my doctor at home when I get back. So on hindsight, waiting till I got home was probably the worst thing that I ever could have done. Um, I didn't manage to see my doctor for at least a week after I got back. But when I went for my test, the urine test, it actually showed negative and it said that I didn't have an infection. So day to day life for me is really varied. Every day when I wake up, it's different. I don't know what I'm gonna get. I don't know if I'm gonna be in excruciating pain, if I'm gonna feel fine, if I'm gonna be up and down. Get everything into organization mode first. So I've got multiple bacteria in my bladder that all need different medication. It's not like a one tablet fits all situation. Um, each bacteria needs a different antibiotic and then each antibiotic causes a range of side effects which need treating. And then there's medication for pain um, and for all the other various things that go alongside, which is less than enjoyable. So I've got my little tablet box because I'm really forgetful with my medication obviously I have to take like 20 tablets a day I find this a lot easier to keep on top of things so for me the worst symptom of all is burning and a lot of a lot of chronic UTI patients will tell you this the burning is unbearable the urgency you feel like you need to wee all the time and there's nothing there and then when you do go it really hurts or you know it's like your body's lying to you and telling you every five minutes you need to go to the toilet you need to go to the toilet and you don't and it's an annoyance as well as painful. Not that I would ever want anybody else to understand how it feels because I would not wish this on my worst enemy, but even to sit on a chair, like this time a year ago, I wouldn't have been able to sit like this because it hurts so much. For me, it's kind of like burning. My bladder burns. It feels like there's glass in there. It feels like I'm on fire. Everything hurts on the outside. It is the most debilitating pain I've ever experienced. And I think as women, we're quite used to pain, especially in the pelvic area, um, but this is, this is something else. So the tests that are used to diagnose UTIs are grossly unreliable, which I now know. Um, they're up to 70% unreliable and they miss a lot of infections and patients like me slip through the net and get misdiagnosed. During the next few months, I was desperately trying to get a diagnosis um, the pain was getting worse and worse and worse, but all my tests came back negative. No one really knew what was wrong with me. And I now know that's because a UTI, which is essentially bacteria floating in your urine, can move from the urine into the walls of the bladder where it's hidden and it can't be detected on a standard UTI test. So in the eight months it took me to find the right doctor, I got progressively worse and worse and worse. Um, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't get dressed, I was in so much pain that at one point I didn't actually want to live anymore. I was sleeping on the bathroom floor for 20 minutes, constantly needing to use a toilet in agony, and nobody could help me. 
I think a thing that actually annoys me a little bit is like when people say, well, you can't be in that much pain because you still do everything. You, you get on with life, like you do stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, because if I didn't just get on with it, I would have been in bed for six and a half years. Like for the first year, I did spend a lot of time in bed and I do go through phases where I don't do much at all. Um, but yeah, like, what do people want me to do? Like, this is daily pain. Like, you have to literally just learn to live with it and get on with it. And everything's hard because if if you're like, I'm too ill to do anything, then literally your whole life is essentially over like that. So it doesn't mean that I'm not in pain and I'm not in agony. It just means that I have no choice but to physically get on with it. So by the time I found a specialist that actually did realise what was wrong with me, I was in such a state that. I was pretty much suicidal. It was unbearable. I couldn't get trousers on, I couldn't get underwear on. So the problem was, every doctor I was going to see was telling me that I had this incurable bladder condition called interstitial cystitis, which means you've got an inflamed bladder, you're in agony, they don't know why, they can't fix it, and that's it for the rest of your life. In, at the point of being diagnosed with that condition at 21, I couldn't imagine living the rest of my life like that. And I remember I used to mark on a calendar and count down the days and say to myself, okay, if I'm still in pain in three months, I'm gonna end my life. It was that bad. And the three months would pass and I'd still be in pain, but then I'd be on a waiting list for a new doctor and I'd think, right, okay, well, I'll wait till I see them. And if they can help me, then I won't do it. And it, it was that bad. And I think no one really understood the mental torture I was going through because I looked fine. Apart from looking exhausted, I, I looked normal and I had all these negative tests and everyone was like, what on earth is wrong with you? So eventually I did get referred to a completely different doctor and he told me about this condition called chronic UTI. Now some people call it chronic embedded UTI, some people just call it embedded UTI and he explained to me for the first time after suffering for nearly a year, day in, day out, that I actually probably did have a UTI, even though all my tests were negative, but it was hiding in the wall, in the lining of my bladder. This for me was amazing because it made sense to me. I feel like for once someone was actually listening and not just saying, this is your life now, go and live it. You're gonna suffer forever. Unfortunately, there isn't actually a cure for chronic UTI, but there's management and there's ways to make me comfortable. So that, for me is better than the initial diagnosis that I got of interstitial cystitis. When I saw this doctor in London, he said to me that what I need is long-term antibiotics, high dose, long-term, so that when the bladder lining sheds, a bit like when your skin sheds, when new bacteria is released all the time, I've always got antibiotics in my system fighting it. Because essentially how it feels is you've got a brand new acute nasty infection you kind of get a grip on it, and then a week later it's back again. But it's not a new infection, it's the same one that just keeps going round and round in circles. So the idea is you go on high dose antibiotics for a really long time so that it's always in your system and it's always fighting this bacteria. So I got put on the treatment plan and I felt a lot better within six months. I started to sleep, I could go out the house again, I could sit down properly again. Um, it definitely wasn't normal, it's not like I'm back to my old self, but it was more comfortable, it's more manageable, and I stopped feeling suicidal, so for me, that's something. For the first four or five years of this condition, I pretty much kept it a secret, and if you followed me for a long time online, it may have come as a shock to you when I kind of went public with this last year. So obviously I've suffered for years, but I just thought it's not sexy, Nobody wants to hear about it, it's disgusting, I was ashamed and I just thought if I hide it and act like it's not a real thing then it won't be a real thing but obviously that was ridiculous. I think that I caused myself more mental trauma trying to hide it because I feel so much better now that I talk publicly about it because it's such a massive part of my life. So I have been taking this um, daily vaccine for my bladder for three months now and I'm coming up to the last few days of it and I'm so happy because honestly, not I take it in the morning at the same time every day and not being able to have a lay in for three months has been really, really hard. Um, so basically this vaccine, it's made up of four bacteria. 
um, like a normal vaccine works. Hello, welcome to my fridge. This is like an episode of Cribs. Um, yep, it's made of four bacteria. If you want to have a little look. Um, and f two of those four bacteria, they've already found in my bladder. So the idea of this is that I take the vaccine every day and it puts, you know, dead bits of that bacteria into my bloodstream and it might make my body create like an immune response and start fighting the infection in my bladder. That's the idea. Not sure if it's been successful or not because I don't feel any different, but we have to keep trying these things. But anyway, today is one of, I think it might be the last day of this actually. So I'm really excited to say goodbye to the damn vaccine. So I felt very low, very lonely throughout, but you know, meeting this new doctor, it gave me a bit of hope and I did manage to get a little bit more comfortable. I stayed comfortable for about a year and unfortunately I caught a new UTI, which obviously is constant. It's a constant risk for any woman, but for me, it's a lot more serious than the standard person that might get a UTI. Again, I went completely backwards. I went downhill. Um, it was worse than ever before and I ended up actually having another surgery on my bladder. Now this doctor told me that um, my bladder was basically destroyed inside, I had no lining left, it was eroded, all the nerves were exposed. So as you can imagine it's exposed nerves, filling with urine all the time, the pain was unbearable. I then went on to have a weekly bladder procedure which again very traumatic and I had to be awake for them, absolutely awful. Um, called a bladder installation, which is where they put drugs directly into my bladder to coat it, to try and protect it where the lining was so damaged. I feel like looking back, this is all a bit of a whirlwind because it was just one thing after another. But luckily, during that period, I managed to find an online support group. And I feel like this changed my life for the better because I was finally meeting other women and girls my age that suffer with this same condition. Now, my mind was completely blown. There are so many women suffering with this. And not just women, there are men as well. But I look back at the five or six years that I didn't know anyone else of this condition, and there was nothing online, there was no news articles, nothing to find or read up on, and I felt extremely lonely and misunderstood. So I wish that I'd found a bladder support group before I did and I hope that by me and all my bladder friends being so vocal it will help other people. So meeting the girls on the support group was amazing. It, it was so nice to talk to women that understand the pain that I'm in. As sad as it is that unfortunately I've got this amazing group of friends now that are there for me all the time, I do feel like it's a bit tainted because the only reason I know them is because they have also suffered equally like I have and that really hurts me inside. In the bladder support group I started to research some of the other doctors that some of my new friends were being treated by. Um, I actually reached out to one of the doctors and she's also now part of my treatment plan. She is amazing, I'm so thankful for her and she's really dedicating her life to chronic UTI patients and trying to help and educate other members of the medical sector like doctors and GPs that simply haven't got a clue and are still relying on these outdated, inaccurate tests. So I've actually got a online Zoom appointment with Dr. Anderson, which I'm gonna share with you so you can listen to things from her point of view. Okay, well let's talk about acute UTI and recurrent and persistently recurrent UTIs. Mm -hmm. Now an acute UTI is defined as an infection of the urinary tract which causes a set of symptoms, usually painful urination and wanting to urinate more frequently. Now the definition of recurrent UTI is a urinary tract infection that happens either at least twice within six months or three times within 12 months. So that is the definition. They haven't really defined which, which one they prefer, but both definitions can be used. And this can be further validated by diagnostic tools. And these diagnostic tools include 
popping a dipstick into the urine, but we know actually in practice and through research and evidence that these dipsticks can be really flawed. Up to 50% of cases in acute, that's flash in the pan, I don't normally get a urinary tract infection, I've got yeah. one, and I'll probably respond the same day to treatment with antibiotics. Even 50% of those come up as negative on the dipstick. Yet, when we put the urine into a traditional culture, they still grow bugs in cultures, showing irrefutably that the patient's symptoms were caused by the bacteria, the germs that were in the urine at the time and attacking the bladder lining and causing the inflammation that caused the symptoms. But the people with UTIs that are happening more frequently, these are people who have more than one episode in six months or more than two episodes, you know, three or more episodes within 12 months, or some, bless them, they're getting episodes every month. Others never seem to come out of their episode. And yeah. that's when we talk about chronic. Chronic means never ending uh, or yeah. persistently recurrent. And the only data that we've actually got, the only studies that we've actually got are on these frequently recurrent UTIs. And we know that 2.4% of women get frequently recurrent UTIs. That's a huge amount. We're talking about 800,000 women in the UK. You have got quite a serious condition. You know, that there, there are, there are, you know, in the UTI journey, there are people who are, you know, they've just got mild recurrence. And then there are people who have this persistent chronic recurrence um, that that is you. And, and and it is very difficult to get that out there to um, the healthcare professionals and also the sufferers because sufferers are always coming in with their own personalized journey and they need to know how bad this condition can get. Yeah. And, and I, I always say when I'm talking about this and talking about this to other healthcare professionals that acute UTI and persisting UTI are different different animals, yeah. different beasts. And actually I've got a talk that I give to nurses. It's got a picture of a hippo on it and a picture of a cheetah. And the cheetah being the acute UTI comes quick, goes quick. Yeah. The hippos, they're there, they move slow. They're yeah. always there, but my God, they're just as deadly. So, yeah. and I like to, to, to draw that analogy because they do behave like different mm illnesses and as women we are the creaky gates you know we are the ones that are almost expected to go wrong in the pelvis you know we get all the period problems we get the menopausal problems you know we we are it's misogyny in some cases not just from the you know not not from male healthcare providers but also from potentiated by female healthcare providers it's not in our culture in in medical culture, in clinicians' culture, to recognise this disease very well. It's not well researched, it's not well funded, and, and it's not well treated, it's not well diagnosed, nothing's done well in this area. It, it, seems, it seems crazy to me that you can go to a GP, and this is where I think it went wrong for me, is I went to a GP, the GPs don't recognise or acknowledge how badly the dipstick and culture tests they use are not that accurate they don't acknowledge that they're not very accurate so when you do test and you don't test positive you're then instantly diagnosed with a bladder pain condition or interstitial cystitis which is incurable and you're told you're not allowed antibiotics and it seems crazy that you've gone to that doctor with an with an infection but even the nice guidelines there is advice that patients should be treated on the presenting symptoms that the uh, yet i hear stories from patients constantly of being patients being turned away and being told it's all in their head because the dip it shows negative now yeah. an awful lot of the gps haven't even read the nice guidelines around uti and let's face it there is only nice guidelines around acute uti and a little mention about recurrent uti and the use of prophylaxis not yeah. enough information and there's absolutely no mention of frequently recurrent persistent or chronic uti but there's a different set of patients as well in starting in the early 2000s it started coming out about 2004 2005 very very good scientific research looking at experimental models with poor old mice that were given e coli bladder infections and they looked at the mechanism that these bugs these bacteria went through and they discovered that it wasn't a new infection every time in fact what these bacteria did was they buried themselves 
into the bladder cells and they set up colonies actually within the cells so it was an embedded infection within the bladder cells that were lining the bladder and then they would form this bulging pod that they called an IBC and um, an intracellular biofilm like community because we term communities of bacteria that are stuck to anything as a biofilm we get biofilms on our teeth it's a plaque yes, it, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got a friend that's a dentist and she says you know we get these these patients that have got infection and it's biofilms and it's stuck to their gums and actually mouthwash doesn't get rid of it mm-hmm. antibiotics don't really get rid of it we have to physically disrupt it we can't on. do that with the bladder, really, you know. No, no. It's it's it biofilm is so different. Did you know that if you posted a glass slide in biofilm, if you let bugs grow a biofilm on a glass slide, you could drop it in neat domestos overnight and in the morning you'd still see a proportion. And I think it's I'd have to check the figures, but I think it's about forty percent of That's the bacterial cool. biofilm is remaining. Why do you think that GPs are ignoring the fact that biofilm and embedded infection exists in the bladder? Because dentists are aware of it in the mouth. GPs are aware of it in other parts of the body, but it's almost like if you mention to a GP that you've got an embedded a chronic or a biofilm bladder infection, they literally look at you like you are insane or like you're making it up but it doesn't exist and it's like we know that biofilms exist everywhere else in the body and embedded chronic infections can exist why are they ignoring the fact that they can be in the bladder and just saying well your dipstick's negative you're making it up so Sophie, you are an expert patient an <laughs> expert patient is a patient that's got so much knowledge they are an absolute expert in the area and most gps have never heard of this concept they do not know the biofilm exists but you know i feel like i do respond to antibiotics to an extent but you know the more i learn about biofilms and the fact that these bacteria can become intracellular and protected it does concern me because i'm like am i ever going to get fully better or is it going to be dormant for a year or dormant until a new bug gets in and then wakes the party up like i just think there's there's no awareness of how serious this infection is versus a normal acute UTI. And, you know, I speak to people and I say, I've got a bladder condition, it's a chronic ongoing UTI. Yeah, I've had a UTI before, yeah, it's really bad. And I'm like, yeah, it is. And I, I, I feel you, an acute three-day UTI is horrible and it is nasty, but it's totally different from a science perspective. It's so much harder to treat and it's a proper condition. And I think for years I was like, yeah I've got this thing I'm not really sure what it is I didn't see myself as an unwell person and now I'm like this is actually quite serious so why why is it so painful um and why do painkillers not work okay so the bladder has has got an exquisite um set of nerves supplying it it's it is very very well kitted out with nerves we call a neuropathic pain in the bladder and so we're better off with the painkillers which target nerve pain so the sort of painkillers that work for slip discs um you know in the back the sort of painkillers that work for diabetics who've got um you know problems with the nerves in their legs because the diabetes has damaged the nerves work a lot better with bladders yeah. than the sort of painkillers yeah. that are given for general pain um so obviously as you know i tried and failed with bladder installations i actually caught or became more acutely infected when i tried them um, and right now i've been on a combination of cephalexin and doxycycline since christmas because I've got the two bacteria that keep appearing in my tests and one's got a resistance to you know, one drug and the other an opposite. So we're treating them individually at the same time, um, as well as antihistamines. Um, I am taking nortriptyline, which is an antidepressant, which helps me with the pain, as you mentioned. Um, I feel like I've gone from being in agony seven days a week to now maybe three days a week. So there's a definite improvement. Um, but it is very slow, so obviously it's been two and a bit months and it's very frustrating because I'm like, okay, how long is this meant to take? How long until I'm fully better? And some days I can have no symptoms at all now, which is lovely, but then the next day it feels really bad when it returns. Why, why is that? Why is it so up and down? And it can change on a day-to-day basis. It can even change you know, within the day. People can yeah. be feeling fine at one it's time of the day. Mind that, you know, you can go to a GP and do one sample, and from that one sample, they can instantly say there is absolutely no infection, it's definitely a bladder disorder or condition, when actually they probably need to be looking at multiple urine tests throughout various days in one week to then actually get a real gauge of what's going on. It's frightening how much awareness needs to be 
be raised. And I must admit, I'm grateful to have found doctors like yourself, but I am scared for my future because I'm really young to have dealt with such a serious case of this. I look at my future, I think, you know, post-menopausal, how am I going to cope? There's so many factors that are going to affect me throughout my life. I'm scared for my future, basically. But, you know, to other people, I look fine. I don't look unwell, so I don't get taken seriously. Sophie, I, to reassure you, you're so young that I'm sure by the time you're postmenopausal, this will be an area which is really well covered. And there's all sorts of things that are coming along in the pipeline. Um, so for the future, that's great, but that doesn't help you with the here and now. Oh, and what yeah. would you really like if we had something better yeah. for you right here and now? What would you suggest for someone that's getting their first onset of bladder symptoms or may have had a, an acute UTI that isn't really going and it's lingering? What would you suggest they do to avoid becoming you know, like this? Right, I think that's a, a very pertinent question. I would say trust your body, listen to your symptoms, don't be fobbed off. Don't be told that you've got to go away because the dipstick is negative. It doesn't matter if the dipstick is negative. You need to find a healthcare professional that can help you and try and get you onto an antibiotic that will work for you. And also don't be told to go away and buy something from the chemist shop because all the things that are available from the chemist, whether they be cranberry, where the data does not back up cranberry as being of real benefit in recurrent QTIs, also, do, do not take some of these sachets that just make the urine less acid, more alkaline, because that may mask the symptoms and give the bugs chance to really hunker down and get in. Yeah. So, you know, listen to your body. It's an alarm going off. You need to go and put out that fire. So I actually did an article with the Daily Mail. Um, they wrote about my story and my condition, and it was published a year ago. And no exaggeration, I get hundreds of messages a week still to this day from people suffering, telling me they want to end their lives, telling me they're in pain, they don't know what to do, can I recommend a doctor? And even though it's quite overwhelming for me, I know that I've helped them and I wish that I had seen an article five, six years ago. So I'm gonna keep doing my best to raise awareness and help other patients and people suffering. Yahoo have released a story today about my condition and like normally I cope really well, get on with everything, I don't really moan um, and for some reason I've just read this story about myself and um, reading it about myself has really upset me because I guess I'm so used to what I've been through and what I go through on the daily that I don't really think about it, it's normal to me and then when I read it start to finish it's um, it's like reading it about someone else and then it really upsets me because I think fuck like I've been through so much and I just I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of it every day. I'm so sick of being in pain. I'm so sick of all of it. There's literally nothing I can do and it won't get better. But anyway, I'll keep embarrassing myself, keep telling the world and annoying everyone going on and on about it because I just hope that it helps other people get treatment quicker than I did because the longer you leave it, the worse it is and it's just so shit. And then you feel guilty because it's not going to kill you. It's not It's not as terrible as some of these other diseases that people live with, but it's so painful. It's so, so painful. <laughs> so, yeah. I just feel a bit overwhelmed when, after reading it, and I guess I'll have a cup of tea. That will help. It will help me feel better, but I'll burn my bladder even more. <laughs> At least I've got Belle to cheer me up. You're not doing a very good job, are you? She's too interested in what's going on outside. Terrible friend. <laughs> so after a pretty emotional day, I'm having some chill time. As you can see, I've got my face mask on. <laughs> it's not very attractive, I'd apologize, but it's just the way it is. Um, I've got Belle here with me. Come here, come here. She is keeping me company. Oh, that's nice little boo-blick. Um, yeah, she's keeping me company tonight. I guess I just got a little bit overwhelmed today. Um, it's one thing when you're like living every day in pain with this condition. I guess you kind of get used to it. Stop! Um, but then when I read the stories about myself, start to finish, it kind of reminds me just how much I've been through and I find it really overwhelming, which is weird, because obviously I've been through it, but when I read it, I'm like, Christ, this really is bad. <laughs>
Uh, she's not allowed on the bed. What are you doing up there? <laughs> so in 2020, during the pandemic, my bladder was worse than it's ever been. And I actually spent pretty much every week in hospital. And two weeks of that, I had to stay in on an antibiotic drip because no matter what they did or what they gave me, we just couldn't get the infection under control. The hardest bit of that for me was one day I was laying in the hospital bed and I had a drip coming out of my arm and I read online on, um, I think it was Yahoo in America, a news story about a girl, 25 years old, who took her own life because she had interstitial cystitis. And I cried and I cried in the hospital bed because I thought, I'm laying here. Nobody really knows what to do with me. None of this really helps. I'm never gonna get better. And nobody understands how serious this is. And yet there are people my age taking their own lives because this is such an awful condition. And I just laid there and cried. So sometimes I do feel like as good as the NHS are and as lucky as we are in the UK to have them, I feel like I've been really let down. So for some reason, nobody knows anything about us as a patient group. Even my GP and my regular doctor seem to think that three days of antibiotics will make me better and that it's all in my head. And it's, it's extremely frustrating to, to be part of a patient group that nobody understands. I do, feel, I do feel devastated, like I've lost the best years of my life to this. And I know that people will look at me online and think, no, you haven't, you, you've been successful, you've done this, you travelled there, but I've literally done it all in pain. Like I've done everything in agony. And I look back at some of the best memories of my 20s and I think, I was in agony then, but you'd never know. And it's cruel that I've had to try and get on with my life because this is so unnecessary. It's such a common infection and it's literally ruined my life. And I feel like for the first three, four years, I would never ever dare moan because I'd think there's so many people that have worse conditions than this. There's people that are dying. There's people that have, you know, life threatening illnesses. And this isn't threatening my life, but it's ruining my life. I can't enjoy my life because of it, but because it's not terminal, I felt like I didn't have a right to moan about it when actually accepting it and accepting that it is ruining my life and that it does mess everything up makes me feel better because I allow myself to be upset and then I move forward. So I'll cry. I'm having a bad day, I'll cry. I'll allow myself to be really angry and think, why has this happened to me? And then I'll pick myself up and be grateful that, you know, other parts of my life are good and I'll try and move on with my day. But it's really, really hard. And you know what, it brings it back to the fact that I'm so thankful to be able to do this as my job and to use OnlyFans and have a supportive fan base because without that, I honestly don't know what I'd be doing today. Without the support from my fans, I don't know where I'd be. I don't know what job I'd be doing because I wouldn't be able to hold down a normal job. And I feel dreadful for the patients that have to try and do that because it is horrendous to try and live like this and try and get on with a day-to-day -day life but I'm so thankful for the fans and subscribers that I've got because they've literally paid for my treatment.